There are many materials used to fabricate CMOS chips. We will make an account of these materials now. So if we take a look at the cross-section of a CMOS chip, and this is an extremely uh, simplified cross-section, we will see that uh, there are several different materials that we use. Uh, first of all, there's silicon. And silicon forms the substrate or the body of all the transistors that we make. So we have here a, a P-type silicon body. So this is P-type silicon. Um, this is used to make the bodies of all the NMOS transistors. We also need N plus silicon, which is used to make uh, the um, uh, drains and sources of uh, NMOS transistors. And we use uh, P plus to create contacts to metal uh, wires, which are used to contact the body of NMOS transistors to ground. So we know that the drains and sources of NMOS transistors form uh, PN junctions with the body. And these PN junctions in correct operation need to be reverse biased. And so uh, to do this, we have to connect uh, the bodies to ground. Uh, any connection is going to be made using uh, metal wires. So if you imagine that you have an NMOS transistor and it has a body terminal, we are going to use a metal wire to con connect this uh, body to ground. The body is P-type. If we form a metal to P-type contact, this contact will be a Schottky diode. It will be uh, rectifying and will not be ohmic. It will not be correct in both directions. Uh, to guarantee that we have an ohmic contact in both directions, we have to contact the metal to heavily doped silicon. And so we use an area of P plus in order to contact the body of uh, the NMOSes, which is in this case, the substrate. Then if we go up, <clears throat> we have silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide, uh, first of all, forms uh, the, uh, the oxide of the metal oxide semiconductor capacitors uh, of the MOSFETs. It is also used to isolate transistors from each other. And it also provides mechanical support for all the upper layers of materials, for all the wires. It holds everything together. So we have silicon dioxide. Then we have the MOSFET gates, uh, which if, if we're going to think about it uh, in simplistic terms, it's going to be metal. And some, some MOSFETs have metal gates. This is true. And if we can make metal gates, that would be good because metal has good uh, conductivity. However, um, in most processes, the gate, uh, the silicon, the uh, MOSFET gate is actually made of silicon, particularly polysilicon. So this is usually heavily doped silicon rather than metal. That doesn't mean that metals are not used. Metals are used, and here we are showing metals being used in a single layer. Later on, we will discover that metals uh, are used in multiple layers in order to uh, facilitate routing, but metals are going to make contacts to uh, gates and to N plus and P plus areas in order to connect the network together. So when you draw multiple uh, transistors, uh, anything that is used to connect the transistors to each other or to ground or to supply, that's all going to be mostly metal wires. So um, we also use metals. <clears throat> now, if we are going to make uh, PMOS transistors as well as NMOS transistors, which is always going to be the case in, in, in a CMOS process, then we also need an area where we can create uh, the, the PMOS transistors. PMOS transistors have an N-type body. Uh, and here we are using a P-type substrate in the wafer. So we have to create an area where there is uh, lightly doped N-type silicon. And this is called a well. So when we have a process in which the NMOSes are created in the bulk, in the substrate of the wafer, and the PMOSes are created in a tub or well of N-type, we call this a single well process. So we have a, an N-well in this case. Within the well, we can create areas of P+, plus, and this will be the source and the drain of the PMOS. We will create a silicon gate uh, to complete the MOSFET. We will also have an area of N+, plus, which is used to contact the well to uh, co connect it to VDD. So there will also be metal wires which are used to connect the rest of the circuit to each other. So it's pretty similar to the NMOS transistors, except that everything is created within the N-well. 
So if you go and look at um, <clears throat> at a uh, an account of uh, of the materials that we have used so far, we have uh, intrinsic silicon, which we actually don't use. So we don't ever use uh, undoped silicon because the conductivity of undoped silicon is really low. So there's no advantage. There's no real advantage to using it. Um, we also use n-type silicon, which is like lightly doped n-type silicon. This is used to make uh, the N-well, uh, which forms the bodies of the PMOS transistors. We use lightly doped P-type silicon, which is uh, the substrate of the wafer. It's the body of the wafer, and it's also sometimes used to make uh, wells in two well processes in which the N-MOSs are also created within wells. Uh, then we have n plus which is heavily doped n-type silicon, which is used to make uh, sources and drains of NMOS transistors, as well as uh, well contacts for PMOS transistors. Um, we have P+, which is used to make sources and drains for PMOS transistors, and the well uh, and the uh, substrate contact for NMOS transistors. Uh, we also use metals, and um, metals are used to make wires. Um, the metal of choice classically in, in, in historical ICs was aluminum because aluminum has, um, has good properties in terms of patterning. So it's easy to form a pattern um, um, which fits with the wire mask. We will see why, but in short, it's because aluminum can be dry etched. Um, now it's mostly copper. So the reason we use copper is because it has a higher conductivity than aluminum. Higher conductivity will translate into lower wire resistance, which translates into lower wire delay, which is really important. However, <clears throat> patterning copper wires is a little bit more challenging than patterning aluminum wires. Now, when we talk about silicon, uh, there's also another distinction we have to make about the kind of silicon we use. So, we distinguish silicon by the kind and level of doping we use, but we also have to think about the crystal structure of the silicon we use. So we know that silicon atoms form uh, four covalent bonds with uh, surrounding um, with, the, with the surrounding with four surrounding atoms, and um, the question is, what is the shape, the three-dimensional shape of atoms when they form these bonds? And so uh, a group of five silicon atoms will form this unit. And you have to imagine it in 3D space um, so that this atom is jutting out of the page. Um, the question is, when we have other silicon atoms connected, um, how, is, uh, how is the crystal structure going to continue? So if, if there are atoms connected to this one, how are they going to continue? And we have two options about this. Either they're going to continue in a regular fashion so that the orientation of all the units is the same, in which case we call this crystalline silicon. Or um, they're going to continue in random directions, in which case we call it amorphous silicon. So whether silicon is amorphous or crystalline depends on um, the crystal structure of the atoms as they arrange next to each other. Crystalline silicon is a uh, way superior to more amorphous silicon in terms of its mechanical and especially its electrical properties. So we always prefer to work with crystalline silicon. In fact, um, amorphous silicon is not a material that we will use um, in semiconductors ever. It has some uses in, like, for example, um, uh, photovoltaic cells, but not in, 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 in semiconductors. Um, now, it's important to uh, point out that um, there are degrees of crystallization in silicon, so we don't have to be on one extreme or the other. It doesn't have to be completely amorphous or a completely uh, crystallized silicon. So we have, if we have a piece of silicon, it could either be uh, a single crystal from beginning to end, in which case we call it monocrystalline silicon, or it could have no orientation whatsoever, in which case we call it amorphous silicon, or it could actually be formed of uh, several uh, domains, each of these domains is arranged as a crystal, but each of them is randomly oriented relative to the other. Uh, in this case, we call this polycrystalline silicon or in general poly polysilicon. And polysilicon has uh, properties that are intermediate between um, single crystal silicon and amorphous silicon. Why would we ever use polysilicon? It's because we can form polysilicon at much lower temperatures than 
monocrystalline silicon. But in any case where uh, conditions allow us to choose between the two, we should always choose single crystal silicon.